I first met Kartik when he was a graduate student um, at Harvard, and he was enthusing about a huge study he was involved in looking at the absenteeism rates uh, of both, both in the public and private sector all across India. So he was collecting data on teacher absenteeism across uh, most of India. And I was struck within the first five minutes, as I think anyone who meets Kartik is, by the level of enthusiasm um, and energy that he conveyed. And he's used that since, that energy and commitment and enthusiasm, to bring together some really amazing coalitions of researchers and, and policymakers and convince large states in India uh, to randomize. Uh, he's also built up a record of working on and providing solutions to those issues that he was looking at as a graduate student of teacher absenteeism and teacher effort. He's now a professor um, at the University of California, San Diego. And he's continuing, as you will hear now, to think big. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Kartik. Uh, so let me just start by saying what a privilege and uh, honor it is to be here. Um, this, is, uh, this project is joint work with Paul Niehaus, who's also at UCSD, and Sandeep Sukhankar at Dartmouth. Um, but there's one interesting theme here, which is all three of us are junior faculty. So Sean Cole talked about our aid of professor, but let me use this opportunity to kind of again thank Esther, Abhijit, Michael, Rachel um, for creating this infrastructure uh, that we've been able to build on. And in many ways, if you think about junior development economists in many parts of the world, a lot of us live in the house that Esther, Abhijit, Michael built, partly in terms of the training we got, and now partly in terms of the infrastructure they've created with JPAL that lets us do really ambitious things. So the project I'm going to talk about today, can I get the slide, um, is kind of an example of using this foundation to build a new room, perhaps even a new floor. Uh, and this is a large scale project. And kind of building off the theme of the last session, it kind of involves very close work with policymakers at scale that you have to take these results seriously for policy. And so that's kind of the theme here. So, so what is the, the background here is, Probably the biggest segment in terms of what the government does uh, for poor people is direct government to G2P transfer. So the G2P segment is worth about $100 billion a year. Right? So that's the amount of transfers that governments are making under various social welfare programs for the poor. Okay, but as anybody who's studied these things knows, there's two fundamental problems these things are plagued by. The first is enormous amounts of leakage and corruption, that the money that leaves the government doesn't reach the poor. And estimates have ranged from being as high as 85% uh, to more modest levels of leakage. But however you think about it, these are unconscionably large amounts of money that are not reaching the poor. Um, so that's part one. And part two is the poor, in general, just have a really hard time accessing these benefits, whether in terms of being able to establish identity or access money through a secure payments channel. And one of the reasons this thing gets even more important is we're in a context of expanding welfare states in a whole range of developing countries, whether it's India or Indonesia or parts of Latin America or Africa. As countries democratize, there's enormous pressure on politicians to do things for the poor. And so trying to push money and push programs through fundamentally leaky buckets is a huge problem. Okay, so this is perhaps one of the most important areas to try and fix. And among the most promising solutions that people have talked about in the past decade have been the idea of electronic benefits transfers authenticated with biometrics. So, and there's initiatives of this sort going all around the world, perhaps none more ambitious than the Unique ID initiative in India. And you saw earlier Nandan Nilakani, who is the chairman of the UID Authority, talk about some of these issues. And I think there's, there's both an enormous amount of hope and an enormous amount of skepticism about whether these initiatives will in fact have an impact. So at one level, you have uh, entities in the government calling this a game changer in terms of enhancing state capacity, where the capacity of the state to deliver benefits becomes a core issue that in development that we need to invest in. So in many ways, I think Lant Pritchett had this description in India of kind of being a flailing state, that there's no connection between the head and the limbs, so you might make the best policy, but if that 
that doesn't get implemented, uh, it's not going to serve you much purpose. Okay, so there's enormous amount of promise, but at the same time, there's a lot of skepticism because there's people who believe that it's really hard to implement um, programs like this. Even if you implement, maybe the real problem are the political vested interests, and all the technology in the world is not going to solve those political problems, which might be why the leakage is happening in the first place. And more importantly, you might also have exclusion errors, whereby the genuine beneficiaries might be inconvenienced if you make them do things like match their biometrics. So this, when the project started, when the UID initiative started, a bunch of us got really excited and thought that this was among the most important and interesting things to study. So we went and had these conversations with the UID authority, supported by JPAL, but kind of quickly realized that the UID was only an enabling infrastructure. And so to evaluate the impact of the biometric payments infrastructure, you would need to integrate those biometrics with an actual program. And the perfect candidate for this was a similar program in the state of Andhra Pradesh, where they had started a biometric smart card program that was already integrated with the two big social welfare programs of the government of AP. So one was the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, and the second one was a Social Security pension. Okay, so um, we'll, it, it was kind of a minor miracle. Uh, Pratap is here, uh, who has project managed this process, but we kind of put together a really ambitious memorandum of understanding and a project that required kind of many, many partners to succeed. Um, and first of all, is JPAL Global. So in fact, it was Iqbal and I who went and had the first conversation with Nanda Nilakani. And in fact, it was JPAL's credibility that opened up that door. I think somebody in the previous session, I think it was Alan, who said, how he couldn't, in fact, run a survey sitting in the government. And so our government counterparts have been delighted that there's somebody with JPAL's technical capacity and independence uh, to come in, like, I mean, and answer questions that's important to them. So they were enormously supportive. But equally important was the support of the Omidyar network. And you know, there's donors around the world who supported JPAL, but ON was particularly supportive here because they basically committed to funding us even before the project was in place because they said this is important enough that I don't want you to go through the effort of getting the government on board to do the project and then wasting another nine months funding the money. Okay, So they were willing and trusted the importance of this enough. So a huge shout out to them for enabling this. And then there's uh, the PIs come from all over the place. And there's the UID authority and the government of Andhra Pradesh. So the project itself um, was kind of this remarkably large scale randomized evaluation where we, ra we had an MOU with the government to randomize the rollout of these biometric smart cards at the level of a sub district across eight districts covering 20 million people. Okay? And, but, but the funny thing is, once you have a conversation with the government, it's not that hard to get them to see why this is a good idea because they don't have the physical bandwidth to implement this across a state of 80 million people in anything less than three years. So all that we were asking, so the way program implementation happens, for those of you who are in government, you'll know that it's usually arbitrary but not random, okay? So all we were asking them to do is kind of replace the unstructured arbitrariness with structured randomness and draw a lottery that allowed us to sequence the order in which the uh, sub-districts were going to be covered, okay? And so... The, the, the key outcomes we were measuring was we had the official administrative data of what the government was paying to every single beneficiary. You're able to draw a random sample from there and go survey those households within six to eight weeks of the spell of work being completed, and we know how much they got paid. Okay, So we know just mechanically the gap between what the government spent and what households received. We know their experiences with collecting the payments, the time delays, and all kind of good stuff. Now, if I had 90 minutes, I would tell you a lot about all the implementation challenges. But from an implementation perspective, in an ideal world, we had an RCT with a two-year gap between treatment and control. And in an ideal world, we've got to 100% implementation. Okay? So now we worked very closely with the government. And again, um, our teams used to be in the monthly review meetings and provide process-based inputs. And at the end of two years, we had gotten to about 50 to 60% coverage of these biometric smart cards. And you know, we didn't know what to make of this. Is this high? Is this low? What do you do? And then I think uh, somebody at Harvard actually gave us some perspective and said, if you look at some relevant US comparisons, it actually took the United States Social Security Administration 15 years to fully transition from paper checks to electronic transfers. Okay, So getting these big systemic changes done in government is not trivial. And for those of you who might think, oh, implementation is hard just in developing countries, I have two words for you. 
okay? Uh, <laughs> okay? Um, and so, so implementation is difficult, all right? Like, I mean, and so we were in a setting where the government had implemented this pretty well, and we had this RCT set up that would allow us to rigorously quantify the impacts. But along the way, we were able to provide a lot of process-based inputs into the government, and that was something they valued almost as much as the impact evaluation, okay? So I've got two final slides on results. And we've just kind of finished analyzing all of this. It's been now about six months. The paper is not yet ready for circulation, but we're seeing some really stunning numbers across the board. Um, and you see that you see significant improvements in the time to collect payments. So people are getting um, just the number of unsuccessful trips you're making to the bank to collect your money has gone down. The delay between when you do the work and when you get paid has gone down. Perhaps most importantly for the poor, the unpredictability in the variance in how long it takes you to get paid has gone down. And there's also a significant reduction in leakage. Now, one of the very interesting things here from an academic economics perspective is there's a huge open question out there on the impact of these public workfare programs on the public, on the private wage market, private labor market. And the entire point is that if the government workfare program is acting as more effective insurance, do you see any transmission onto the private market? And one of the things we're able to get at because of this large scale randomization at scale is we actually in fact find a significant five to 6% effect on the open wage market, okay? And in fact, there's other studies that show that the effect of the entire program on the open market was on the order of five to 6%. And so what this highlights is that better implementation can be almost as important as the programs you design in terms of the impacts you find, okay? So the final slide, and in many ways, from a policy perspective, the most important was just a very simple um, analysis from the beneficiary's perspective of whether they like the new system. And there's overwhelming support, okay? About 84% in the NREGS and 90% in the pensions prefer the new system, and less than 10% dislike it. Now, the reason this slide is so important in terms of the political economy of policy, and very much in the spirit of the conversation in the previous discussion, is notice that cutting corruption is not something that is Pareto improving, right? There are people who's gonna be cut out. There's people whose the rents and benefits that the middlemen were making are gonna be cut out. Okay, so this is an interesting project where the administrative bureaucracy was pushing the new technology, but there was resistance from the political structures, right, that were coming back. But remember, the political structure from the grassroots cannot come back and say, don't do this because we can't make money. What they're gonna say is don't do this because you're inconveniencing poor beneficiaries who might not be able to match their fingerprints, okay? So the type of feedback they would often get from the field would be that the one or two stories about things going wrong, okay? And the time when we made this presentation, apparently the government had literally issued an order saying that for the pension programs, we should stop doing the biometrics. And this was a presentation which we made to the chief secretary of the state State, and literally at the end of that, I can mean they rescinded those orders. And so it's a classic example of concentrated costs and diffuse benefits, okay, of a new program. And the political economy is that the few guys who lose are losing a lot and they're gonna make a lot of noise, okay? And so the value of an objective independent analysis from people who have no skin in the game beyond kind of speaking in the public interest, essentially A, gives us a seat at the table and B, makes the messages enormously credible, okay? So I'm gonna just end up with the anecdote of kind of Mr. Subramaniam, who, if you see this online, like, you know, I mean, you'll recognize the story. So, one of the implementation challenges is he was the principal secretary, but we had signed the MOU with his predecessor, okay? And so he shows up, and the first thing he's looking at these review meetings about the rollout, and he's saying, why are we randomly holding back some places, okay? This makes no sense. And so Pratap, who's the project manager, called me at 1 a.m. once and said, Karthik, help! Principal secretary just said, what is this Jaypal? Who is this Jaypal? Like, I mean, can we just forget all of this and just go ahead? And two years later, the same principal secretary, or three years later, kind of literally said on record that the state and the country owes you a huge favor for having taken up this study. So that was just a really gratifying experience from start to finish, and that's a great note to end. Thank you.